from its giant waterfalls to its sequoia trees and incredible valley. I'm taking you to some of Yosemite's top places, including what just might be its most popular hike. And one of the most dangerous too. So let's get straight to it. We're headed to the top in this guide to Half Dome and Yosemite National Park. The Famous Half Dome This Yosemite icon rises nearly 5,000 feet from the ground below. Its challenge has attracted professional climbers and experienced hikers for decades. Look, I'm not in the best shape on planet Earth. I'm willing to admit that, okay? For this trip though, I trained as hard as I could knowing that it was 14 miles to the top of Half Dome and back. The thing is, we didn't even know if we were going to be allowed to hike it. Not that they restrict it to people like me who could afford to lose a few pounds or anything. You're going to need a permit to hike Half Dome during the busiest months of the year. And they only give out about 300 of those a day. 225 of those are won by a lottery held in the month of March. The other 75 are given out by lottery, two days before the date that you're applying for. And do you think that I planned ahead and applied for a permit back in March? Of course not. Why do you think we were camping an hour outside of the park? We had only started looking for a campsite like maybe a month before. We were lucky to find anything at all. If you want to hike Half Dome or even just stay in Yosemite, make sure you plan way ahead. Campsites in Yosemite Valley are available for reservation five months in advance on the 15th of each month at 7 a.m. Pacific time. Simple, right? No, of course not. For example, if you wanted to book a campsite for dates between May 15th and June 14th, the earliest you could book is the morning of January 15th. And campsites go quick when reservations open up. Most are gone within a matter of minutes. My friend Andrew and I were wrapping up our trip in the Sierra Nevadas and started our day in Kings Canyon National Park, about three hours south of Yosemite. We would only have two chances to win a half dome permit. Actually, make that one. By the time we made it back into a part of the park that had cell service, we found out we had lost. Either way, it was on to Yosemite. Right from the beginning, Yosemite doesn't disappoint. This is Tunnel View. It's many people's first look at the absolutely spectacular Yosemite Valley. The sheer wall of El Capitan on the left, Bridal Veil Falls flowing on the right, and Half Dome in the center, off in the distance. Believe it or not, the valley, the most popular part of Yosemite, wasn't always a part of the park. It took a little bit of help. In 1903, President Teddy Roosevelt joined a 65-year-old John Muir in Yosemite. Intrigued by Muir's elaborate writings over the years about the area. An avid outdoorsman, Roosevelt abandoned his Secret Service detail to spend three nights with Muir. Their first spent camping at the base of the Grizzly Giant, Yosemite's most famous sequoia tree, found in the Mariposa Grove, the second near the valley's rim and glacier point, and the third in the valley itself, where Muir made his plea to the president, protect this land and incorporate Yosemite Valley into the entire national park. Muir's words would go on to have a profound effect on the president, and what would become known as the camping trip that changed the nation led way to Roosevelt signing the Yosemite Recession Bill in 1906, officially incorporating the valley into the park. It also led to the Antiquities Act, 
which gives presidents the power to set aside federal land for protection as national monuments, and maybe one day as national parks. New Mexico's White Sands, Maine's Acadia National Park, Utah's Bears Ears, and California's Muir Woods National Monuments are just a few examples of some amazing places protected under the Antiquities Act. The two men picked a great spot for a photograph, too. Yosemite is full of amazing views and vistas, but none may be as grand as Glacier Point. Reached by the Four Mile Trail, or far more easily, by car, the views of the valley, and especially Half Dome, are breathtaking. From here, we could see the waterfalls of the Mist Trail, which we would be taking if we want a permit to hike Half Dome. While no time of day disappoints, sunset is when the valley really puts on a show from Glacier Point. I mentioned before that Half Dome can be kind of dangerous. A number of people have actually died while hiking it, usually from falling during the final summit. In fact, and incredibly tragically, about a week before we were planning on doing Half Dome, a hiker fell to her death. What makes this part so dangerous though? The answer is the cables. It's around 14 miles round trip to the top of Half Dome and back. And for the last 500 feet or so, you're hauling yourself up the incredibly steep backside of Half Dome using these metal cables. It's around a 65 degree angle in the middle. There's wooden slats bolted into the rock too, but they're pretty well spaced out. It can take anywhere from three to five steps to go from one to the next. Thunder, rain, or even dark clouds off in the distance is noticed to stay off of Half Dome. Wet and slick rock has caused a number of the falling deaths on the cables. But this isn't to scare anyone. With the proper precautions, you'll be just fine. There's three essentials when hiking Half Dome. At least four liters of water, hiking boots with good grip on the bottom, and some sort of rubber gloves. These are four dollar gardening gloves. Uh, maybe. While they're not fashionable, they got the job done. Otherwise, you run the risk of shredding your hands on the cables. We called it a night and headed for our campsite outside the park in Stanislaus National Forest. Tomorrow we were planning on hiking Yosemite Falls, and, more importantly, we'd find out if we'd win a permit for Half Dome or not. Yosemite Valley is full of famous features, but none may be more famous than the vertical granite wall that is El Capitan. A mecca for rock climbers, hundreds make the journey up its face to the top each year. No journey may be more famous than Alex Honnold's climb in 2017, when he summited without any harness or protective gear, as seen in the documentary Free Solo. I'll stick to hiking for now, and there actually is a route to the top, by taking the Yosemite Falls Trail. This park is home to more than a few waterfalls. Bridal Veil Falls greets you when you first enter, and its base can be reached by an easy half mile round trip hike. Vernal and Nevada Falls are found on the Mist Trail, on the way up to Half Dome, but more on those two later. For now we're hiking to the grandest of them all and the tallest in all of North America. Yosemite Falls. Well, I wish it had looked like that when we were there. Many of the waterfalls in Yosemite are created by snowmelt and flow at their strongest in the spring and early summer. We were visiting in mid-September and instead, Yosemite Falls looked like this. So all the footage of beautiful flowing waterfalls you see in this video is actually from our return trip last spring. It's a 7.2 mile hike to the very top and back down, and it's pretty much all switchbacks. While we still had cell service though, we submitted our final entry to the Half Dome Lottery, and then 
began the hike up. We made it about two miles into the hike and stopped at a lookout area for lunch. Half Dome was visible the entire way, and I'm not going to lie, it was making me a little bit anxious. The funny thing about Yosemite Valley is that, for a national park, it has pretty good cell service. So it was up here on the trail that I got the notification. We had won the lottery. I was excited, but still not actually sure if I wanted to do it. This would be a pretty terrible video about hiking Half Dome if I didn't actually hike Half Dome though. Since our permit was for two days from now, we took the following day to rest and to explore some of the easier hikes and sites in the park. John Muir once said, the big tree is nature's forest masterpiece, and so far as I know, the greatest of living things. He of course was referring to the giant sequoia trees, of which you'll find several groves in Yosemite. The best though is probably the Mariposa Grove. Found near the park's southern entrance, it's a two mile hike to the grove from the visitor center, or you can catch a free shuttle bus up there. You'll find a series of trails in the grove, but the premier attraction is the two mile round trip hike to the Grizzly Giant, the very tree that Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir camped under together. 2,700 years old and 209 feet tall, it's the 26th largest tree in the entire world. And behind it, you'll find the California Tunnel Tree, one of very few tunnel trees that are still standing. And yes, you can walk through it. Sequoias have their own national park though, that you can check out in my video linked above. On the opposite end of the park, and high above Yosemite Valley, is a place you could easily spend days exploring. And it also happens to be one of the most famed mountain passes in America. Tioga Road. Only open from roughly late May through October, this drive will take you high up into the Sierra Nevada mountains. No trip to the high country would be complete without a stop at Tenaya Lake, whose clear blue water you're free to kayak, canoe, or even swim in, if you dare. It's pretty cold. Otherwise, you can just take the easy two-mile loop trail that goes around the lake. Another must-see along Tioga Road is Tuolumne Meadows. At over 8,000 feet of elevation, it's one of the highest meadows in the entire Sierra Nevada range. Snow-capped peaks dot the horizon, while granite domes rise above the tree line up here. And the Tuolumne River flows through the meadow itself. Following the Tuolumne River to the northwest corner of the park, you'll find one of the least visited and best kept secrets in Yosemite. Hetch Hetchy Valley. The reservoir here provides drinking water for the city of San Francisco. Therefore, no swimming or boating is allowed despite how enticing it looks. This place doesn't come without controversy though. The damming of Hetch Hetchy was staunchly opposed by John Muir and the Sierra Club, and it's easy to see why. It was said that Hetch Hetchy Valley used to rival Yosemite Valley for its beauty. But nonetheless, in 1924, the dam was completed and the reservoir began to fill. You're free to visit Hetch Hetchy, walk across the dam, and hike some of Yosemite's less traveled trails. Despite how peaceful it was up here, I couldn't help but still be anxious. Especially considering what happened on Half Dome the week before. This would also be the longest hike I've ever done, and while I trained hard for it, I still wasn't sure if I was ready or not. But tomorrow, well, there was only one way to find out. With plenty of snacks and water packed, 
we hit the trail around 6.30 a.m. A little bit later than we planned on, to be honest. Found near the back of the valley along Happy Isle Road, we would be taking the Mist Trail to start, past those two waterfalls I mentioned earlier. It's about two and a half miles to the top of Vernal Fall and back, and around five and a half to the top of Nevada Fall and back. The first mile or so is a paved gradual incline, which ends at what will likely be your first stop. The Vernal Fall Footbridge. It's your last chance to fill up on water, and for flush toilets. From here, it's pretty much nothing but steep stairs and switchbacks to get to the top of either waterfall. In the springtime, the mist generated by Vernal Fall can leave hikers drenched as they climb the staircase on its right. A staircase that also gets pretty slick with all the water on it. Hence the name, the Mist Trail. But in the fall when we were here, we were just lucky there was any water going over the edge at all. The Mist Trail was pretty tough, at least for me. But once you're past Nevada Fall, it does get easier for a bit though it's still kind of uphill. If you're not hiking Half Dome, you're still free to hike the Mist Trail. It's not a bad idea to take the John Muir Trail back down too. It adds an extra mile and a half, but it's easier on your knees for sure, and gives you some awesome different views of Liberty Dome and both waterfalls. Honestly, the next three or four miles of the hike were a little bit boring, but not necessarily in a bad way. It was pretty peaceful, venturing through Little Yosemite Valley and upwards through the forest. But all good things have to come to an end. We had reached the permit check and the beginning of the subdome. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm no athlete and I'm not in the greatest shape ever. While I did train for Half Dome, this part of the hike was definitely one of the toughest. The subdome is steep, completely exposed to the sun, with slippery, worn down rock the entire way. And the trail isn't that well marked. Though the only way to really go is up. And once you reach the top, it finally comes into view. The subdome left me absolutely exhausted. So the base of the cables was the perfect place to take a break. We couldn't have asked for better weather. We put our packs on, secured anything loose, and gloved up. It was time to start the trek up to the top. It wasn't easy at first, but you actually get used to the process on the cables. They're pretty much always crowded, and it's essentially a one-way path that's forced to be two ways. So you'll need to call out to the person coming down and figure out who gets to go first. Take breaks on the wooden slats as needed, and don't be surprised if you get caught in a traffic jam of people and have to wait a bit before moving on. And if you're scared of heights, it's probably best not to look behind you. The view behind you is actually pretty amazing, but you'll be able to enjoy it from the top. After a while, any fear I had was gone. It took about 45 minutes to reach the top, mostly because of all the other people. And was it ever worth it? With a 360 degree view, Yosemite had never looked better. We took our time up at the top, taking plenty of pictures, posing for the famous top of Half Dome photo, and resting. We did still have to go back down after all. We also got a different perspective of some places we'd already visited on this trip. The jury's out on what's easier, going up or down. But for me, 
it was definitely easier going down the cables. Probably because at this point there weren't that many other people on them. The rest of the journey down definitely dragged on for a bit. We just wanted the hike to be over at this point. And 11 and a half hours later, we finally reached the valley floor once again. I'd never felt more accomplished hiking anything in my life. So obviously, I had to buy a tacky souvenir to commemorate it. Even if you don't win a permit to hike Half Dome, there's still plenty of amazing things to do and see in Yosemite. That's all I got. Oh, except for one thing. Check it out. Literally anyone can buy one of these in the gift shop. You don't actually have to hike Half Dome. <laughs>